18, Isaiah 30, beginning in verse 18, 18, just picking the study up right where we left off. Let's pray and then just, just receive from God's word tonight. Father, thank you so much for your word. We know that you want to give us your heart, and in receiving of your heart, we are the ones that are blessed. We are the ones that have the favor of God poured out upon us because we know that you send your word. It's active, alive, it's living, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sent with your purpose to transform our lives. And so, Lord, tonight we just open our heart and just pray that you would use this word in our lives by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Isaiah, the prophet, is giving them words in advance about the things that are going to be happening. Now, as we've seen in prophecy, and we're going to see it tonight as well, there's often a near fulfillment, and then there's a far fulfillment, and we're going to see this. The backdrop of what's happening right now is that uh, Assyria is a world-dominating power, and Assyria is already devastated nations. At this point when he writes, it is already devastated nations. The northern kingdom of Israel has been attacked and destroyed. Um, even uh, the kingdom of Judah in the south has seen some of that because some of the cities have been attacked. And uh, so in light of that backdrop, God is going to give them words of wisdom and words to strengthen their faith because God is about to do something absolutely beyond their imagination. God is going to do something about this, this threat that is so absolutely beyond the, the pale of imagination if they would only trust God for it. And so this is the, this is the backdrop. You see now, and we're going we're gonna to see it in a little bit in the next chapter, but we saw it earlier also where God was saying, hey, woe to those who go down to Egypt and trust in them, rather than to trust or rely upon their God. And so what had happened was that there were these advisors who were trying to advise the king, hey, here's what we can do. Uh, in regard to this threat of Assyria, I know what let's do. Let's go down and, and let's go down to Egypt and let's make a, let's make a, a, a partnership with them so that the strength of Egypt will be the one that saves us from Assyria. And, and God says, don't you do it. Because God's going to do something to save in a marvelous way. What was interesting, the very first view, uh, the, the verses just before this, uh, some of the wealthier ones uh, in, e, uh, in Israel had decided that they were going to get on swift horses and they're just going to make their escape. And so God, the last few verses, is saying, uh, they're going to pursue you. This is a wrong move. You stay and rest right where God has called you to be and watch what God is going to do. In fact, in verse 18 where we started, notice this verse. It's such a great verse for us to receive personally. Listen to this great word. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Oh, how blessed are those who long for him. You see the, the, the turnabout there? Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. This is the Lord's heart. Oh, man, does he ever want to be gracious to you? Do you believe this? See, this is the heart of God after us. He saves us by his grace. He pours his favor out upon us by his grace. Uh, and the scripture says, even no matter the degree of your sin, his grace is even greater than that. No matter what sin you got in your life, God's grace is even greater than that sin. So great is it. And therefore, I love this word. The Lord like longs. There's that word longing. Oh, he wants to pour out, be gracious to you. Therefore, he waits on high to have compassion. The Lord's a God of justice. Oh, how blessed are those who long for him. That's our heart. Long for him now. Long for that grace. There's a relationship that God so desires. I will be your God. You will be my people. 
I will be your father, you will be my son, you'll be my daughter. The Lord wants that relationship where we rely on him as our father. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who love him. There's that call to relationship and intimacy. All right, it continues on verse 19. Oh, people in Zion, that's Jerusalem, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he'll answer you. And, and Hezekiah, the king, is going to call out. We're going to read this in a few chapters down. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he is your teacher. So this is important. He, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. God is going to do something so amazing. And your ears, I love this verse. I, I love, I've quoted this verse so many times. Listen to this because it's a great word that kind of helps us to understand how the Lord walks with us and directs our steps as we go through life. He says, look, this is the kind of relationship I want to have with you. Notice verse 21. And your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. See, you, you got to hear, like, there's a word behind you. Like you, you're, you're, you're walking and you come to a, a, maybe a turn in the road and you hear this word behind you. This is the way, walk in it. And you, what is that word? Of course, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. This is the way, walk in it. Go this way. No, don't go that way. That, that road there is a bad road, man. That road there is the road to death and destruction. This is the way. Walk in. Have you ever felt the Lord directing you and your steps? Have you ever felt the Lord giving you a warning? Don't go there. <laughs> See, this is, this is, I love this perspective. This is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. And it says, then you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver, and you will defile your molten images plated with gold. You will scatter them as an impure thing, and you will say to them, be gone. Don't you love this verse? He says, look, this is what's going to happen. That relationship, he's, he said, oh, I long to have this kind of relationship to you where I'm just speaking into your heart, and you're walking as I direct you, and then those impure things... I want them out of my life. See, notice that it follows the intimacy. Notice that it follows the closeness of the Lord. See, many people have this in reverse. Many people think, oh, I will get my act together. I will get my life clean, and then the Lord will take me in. Can I tell you something? It'll never happen that way. You will never, ever get your life so clean that the Lord says, oh, I am so impressed with you, I can't help myself. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It will never happen that way. What happens is that we come to the Lord messed up, dirty, loaded down with our own sins, and the Lord says, no, you come humble and know that I'm the one who forgives I'm the one who blesses. And by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, see this is, what is this? This is grace. This is just grace. All of our sins were paid, were put on the cross and paid by Jesus Christ when he died in our behalf instead of us. That's love, that's grace, that's compassion, that's mercy. There is just so much to it that's based all on the heart of God's love for us. It's his love after us. Don't you know, he says in the book of Romans, it's the kindness of God that, what? Leads you to repentance. See, as soon as we enter into that grace and understand that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning, and as we draw near to him, he is the one who then begins to cleanse our life. But how? How does he do it? He is the one who restores the soul. He ignites joy in our hearts. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We delight in him, and therefore we look at the things that are impure, and we say, be gone. Because it doesn't even hold a candle 
to the glory of God in our lives. I don't want that stuff in my life because it doesn't hold a candle to the glory. Now, do you know that the glory is like light? We've been kind of seeing this in John 1. It's like light. When I say it doesn't hold a candle, that's a good picture. You got a candle, uh, you know, it doesn't, that's like the, 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 the world's offering, just a little candle in comparison to the glory of the Lord. And that's his point, all right? Be gone, get out of my life. Verse 23, he then will give you rain for the seed. Notice now the favor of God being poured out. He then will give you rain for the seed which you have sown in the ground. He will give you bread from the yield of the ground, and it will be rich and plenteous. On that day, your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture, and also the oxen and the donkeys which work the ground will eat salted fodder. That was a luxury. Which have been winnowed with shovel and fork, and on every lofty mountain and on every high hill there will be streams running with water on the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. And the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter. So the, the favor of God will be like this. Like the light of seven days, on the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the bruise that he has inflicted. This is a great word of encouragement. Now, there is a, a second fulfillment. It's going to be fulfilled when the Lord absolutely, miraculously breaks the back of the Assyrian army. He's going to do this in an amazing way, which we're going to read about here. But he's going to break the back of the Assyrian army, the greatest army that the world has ever seen at this point. And the back of the Assyrian army is going to be broken outside the gates of Jerusalem. What's interesting is that this is historically uh, even accounted in other uh, uh, annals of history, even other than the scriptures of what God is going to do. And so this is a word he's giving them in advance. I'm telling you in advance. Be in awe of this word. Now, it has an immediate fulfillment. What's interesting, it also has a second fulfillment, a greater fulfillment in the latter days. Because we know Jesus described a day of great tribulation when the wrath of God is poured out on the nations, which we're going to read about in a bit, the, the wrath of God is poured out on the nations and on the earth itself, and in fact, great armies will come against Israel. As the Assyrian army came from the north, so also in that day, that latter day, a great army will come through the valley of Megiddo, and a great army will then attack Israel, but God will break the back of the enemy, and a great result of of course, rescue and salvation for the nation of Israel as the Antichrist himself will lead them. And so this has got a second fulfillment as well. All right, now, verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from a remote place, burning in his anger, dense in his smoke. Okay, and this is when the Lord's going to do it. This is when the Lord's going to bring about the fulfillment. His lips are filled with indignation. You kind of, what you need to kind of sense here is a determination of the Lord. If you've ever seen kind of a, a, a warrior with a face of determination and his lips are, 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 are pursed with determination, nothing is going to stop this war, this warrior you're going to picture. Notice how he describes it. His lips are filled with indignation. His tongue is like a consuming fire. And his breath is like an overflowing torrent which reaches to the neck to shake the nations back and forth in a sieve. You, and this is a second fulfillment. You can imagine those nations uh, led by Russia, the scripture suggests. The nations will be shaken back and forth in a sieve and put in the jaws and, and to put in the jaws of the peoples the bridle which leads to ruin. And then it says, you have, you will have songs. The rescue, the rescue. You will have songs as in the night when you keep the festival. You will have gladness of heart as when one marches to the sound of a flute. To go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard. 
and the descending of his arm to be seen in fierce anger. He's telling them all of this in advance. Why? To strengthen their faith. God uses the word to strengthen our faith, just like he was in those days. How is he doing it in our days? He's telling us in our own days the signs of the times. Will you discern the signs of the times? I'm telling you the things that are happening in advance so that your faith will be strengthened and that your life will be on solid ground, a foundation in a time of storm. That is the word of the Lord given in advance. And so it tells us, the descending of his arm will be seen in fierce anger and in the flame of a consuming fire, in a cloudburst, downpour, hailstones, and at the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be terrified when he strikes with the rod in every blow of the rod of punishment which the Lord will lay on him will be the music of tambourines and lyres, and in battles brandishing weapons he will fight them. For Tophath has long been ready. Okay, Tophath in that day was a, a place uh, where they were doing uh, human sacrifices to Moloch. It was tragedy. They would do it by fire. And so what he's doing in here, he's, he's turning it about on them. He's kind of reversing it on them. And he is saying, look, Topheth has been ready. Indeed, it has been prepared for the king. You see how he's turning it around? He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood. For the breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, will set it on fire. Uh, it's pretty ominous, you know, intimidating words. But it's also words to strengthen the faith of those who are facing an enemy who is absolutely cruel in nature. Uh, Assyria was f infamous for the degree of their cruelty. In fact, uh, uh, whole cities would commit suicide in advance rather than to, uh, to capitulate and become prisoners of war to Assyria. So uh, uh, cruel was this people. And so that's why the Lord describes it this way. Chapter 31, so he then says, in a very practical way, so woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and, and, and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and they trust in horsemen because they're very strong. But they don't look to the Holy One of Israel. They don't seek the Lord. Now, right away, we got a call to ourselves here out of faith. We need to apply the same to our lives. Oftentimes, the Lord is the last one that people turn to for help. They, 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 rely, they try to turn to every other thing. But the Lord is saying, no, you rely on me. Not on horses, not on chariots. Though they be strong is nothing in comparison. Trust in God, trust in God. And the Lord will do it. And I know this, I've seen it. I know that God wants us to trust him because he is amazing in his answer. And it, whenever I read this, I'm reminded of something personal in my own life, uh, and that is that, you know, when I, when I felt, my wife and I felt this call to go into ministry, um, I was at the time a part owner of a restaurant and managing a restaurant, and, and uh, yet I was a volunteer at, uh, as, a, uh, as a youth leader at this church, and, um, but I felt this very strong call to go to ministry, you know, full time. But the, of course, the issue is, how am I going to how am I going to pay for it? This is uh, expensive to go to Bible college and get a Bible education to get you know prepared to go into ministry. And uh, I, I came up with this plan. I had this idea because we were negotiating. We were in the middle of this negotiations to get another restaurant. We were going to add this restaurant. And uh, so my plan was, I know what I'll do. We'll get this extra restaurant. And it was almost like being given to us. It was an amazing deal. And uh, so we'll get this extra restaurant. My partnership will be worth quite a bit more. I will sell my partnership, take the proceeds from this sale, pay my way through college, and I have, Lord, I have a plan. All I need you to do is just sign on the bottom line and bless the plan that I have come up with. You know, in advance, this is not going to work. So... <laughs> 
Uh, I remember this one particular Friday, uh, I was at a marriage uh, retreat at the church I was going to, and my partner came late to it, because he was also there. He came late to it, and he said, I've got to tell you something. I've been in meetings today about this deal. I think the people we're dealing with are unethical, and I want you to know I killed the deal. And as a Christian, I knew you would understand that. So I just wanted you to know the deal is dead. And of course, I said, yeah, I, I perfectly understand that. And, I, and then Saturday, that was Friday night, all day Saturday I'm praying, Lord, I, that was my plan, Lord. But my prayer went like this, Lord, I don't want to go to a bank. I don't want to rely on a bank. Lord, I don't want to rely on the government. I'm asking, I'm asking, would you do a miracle? Would you provide, would you, would you just reveal yourself through this? And so that I know and, and everyone knows that it's a miracle, I'm not going to tell anybody I need this. I'm just asking God. I'll rely on you. And one way or the other, I trust you. If it goes this way or that way, I trust you. And so I, I went to bed Saturday night just with peace. Got up Sunday morning just so eager to get to, to church. I got to church. I was about maybe 10 steps in the door. A fellow came up and just put his hands up like this. He said, stop, I need to tell you something. I said, okay, what? Well, he said, God told me this week, I'm supposed to pay your way through Bible college. <laughs> go, really? And we got together and, we, and, you know, we talked about what that meant. And apparently, I found out it meant exactly what he said. In fact, he said, I told my wife about this and she said, I already know because God told that to me a couple weeks ago. And I figured that if it really was God, I wouldn't have to tell you that. And so, again, there was that confirmation. But see, my point, and, he, and it was a glorious answer to that great need. And I, every time I read this in the scriptures, I think about that. Lord, I don't want to rely on anything else. I want to rely on you. And I know that God wants us to trust him. Either way, either way, God, I'll trust you. See, it's important. See, do not look he says, they don't look to the Holy One of Israel. They don't seek the Lord. He says, I want you to. Verse 2, yet he also is wise and will bring disaster. He is wise. He will bring disaster. He knows. He will not retract his words. He will arise against the house of evildoers. In other words, Egypt is good. You think you're going to rely on Egypt. You think Egypt is so strong? Let me tell you something. They will be destroyed. In this Egypt that you rely on, they will be destroyed. Notice what it says. He will not retract his words. He will be against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now, the Egyptians are men. They are not God. Their horses are flesh. They are not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out his hand, and he who helps you will stumble. Egypt will stumble. And he who is helped will fall. And all of them will come to an end together. They'll just collapse together because Assyria will destroy them. For thus the Lord says to me, as the, this, get this picture in your mind. It's really a powerful picture. Thus says the Lord, as the lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out, the lion will not be terrified at their voice, nor will that lion be disturbed at their noise so will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war against them. He will come down to Mount Zion, and he will come down upon its hill and wage war against them like a lion standing over its prey. Now, kind of picture in your mind, you know, you, you have this lion, right? And he has this prey, and he's standing over his prey, and, uh, and the, the, a shepherd wants to come and try to take that prey from him, but the lion is standing over, and he's got this big growl. You know, I can't do it. You know, uh, you know, and there's this, imagine this intimidating growl of this lion. He's standing over his prey and this look on his face, like, don't you try it. You know, I say, like, make my day, sort of thing, you know. But there's that power that says, you're not coming anywhere near. There's that picture of God standing over Jerusalem like a lion and growling at Assyria, you will not defeat 
my people. Urgh, you know, and there's this power that he's saying. Just like, the, notice what he says next, verse 5. Like flying birds, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. Uh, in another place it suggests like hovering birds. That's a, that's, a, that's a picture. They will protect Jerusalem. He will protect it. He will deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Return to him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. Now there's that call right there. There's the prophet's call. Why does God send prophets right there to call them? to get them to come back, to get them to rely on the Lord, to get them to begin to trust in faith. Right there it is. Return to him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. Turn back. You have defected. Turn back. See, what I love about this is you might say, well, it's kind of a strong word. Yeah, but isn't it a call to come back? See, the, the Lord isn't saying, I've had enough of you. You be gone. He's not saying that. He's saying, look, I will stand over you like a lion over his prey. I will growl at those who try to approach. I will be like a hovering bird, uh, uh, birds over Jerusalem. I will save, I will deliver, I will rescue. So come back. Come back. You have defected, my sons. Come back. Return to me. Notice then what he says. For in that day, every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols, which your hands have made in sin. Come back, come back. And when you come back to me, you're going to look at those idols that you've made with your hands in sin, and you're going to get rid of them, and you're going to want to get rid of them. See, I love that part there. You can see it in Scripture, several different places. You're going to want to get rid of them. I don't want these anymore. The things of the world go stra grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I don't want those things anymore. And then he tells us what's going to happen, verse 8. And the Assyrian will fall by a sword, not of man. Now this is a strange prophecy. How is this possible? The Assyrian will fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of man will devour him. He will not escape this sword. And we know from history that Assyria, after they went down and defeated Egypt, swept back through, up toward uh, Jerusalem, besieged it with a vast army. And when Israel awoke, 185,000 of their soldiers lay dead upon the ground, mysteriously. The scripture says that an angel of the Lord came and laid them down in death. This is found in the annals of history outside of the scriptures. And it is an amazing feat because he tells them in advance that Assyria will fall by a sword not of man. I don't know about you, but I, I love to see prophecy so wondrously fulfilled. It's a strengthener of faith. And so it says, he will not escape. His young men will become forced laborers. His rock will pass away because of panic. And princes will be terrified at the standard. Declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Chapter 32. Behold, here's the result. A king will reign righteously. Princes will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will listen. And the mind of the hasty will discern the truth. And the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. For no longer will the fool be called noble. Now, listen, follow with me. Because this, these verses are so great. These are, I got to tell you, so encouraging. Listen to what he says, verse 5. No longer will the fool be called noble. No longer will the rogue 
be spoken of as generous. Generous. For a fool speaks nonsense. A fool is a fool and he speaks nonsense. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You, are you with me? A fool speaks foolishness and it's supposed to be known as foolishness. We are in trouble when a fool speaks and people think it's wisdom. You with me? Because I, I look at what's happening today and the whole thing that's going on in our country and in the world, things are upside down. Amen? Things are wrong. There's something wrong here. What's going on is things are upside down. A fool speaks and he's thought of as wise. A rogue speaks is spoken of as generous, as generous. This is wrong. And here, here's what he's saying. Back to verse 1 and those words that follow. He's saying, look, when the Lord rescues, when the Lord saves, he's going to set some things right. Okay, now it has two fulfillments. One is when Israel uh, saw the hand of the Lord miraculously defeat the back uh, uh, of the Assyrian army, breaking their back by the defeat of this 185,000, what followed then was a period of revival. Things got right. Hezekiah led then in a revival in Israel. That was right. That was good. Now, in a similar way, when the Lord himself, in those latter days, steps foot on the Mount of Olives, and the Lord returns to earth to take his place in Jerusalem as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he will defeat the Antichrist and break the back of the nations and this great army coming from the north. He will, in a similar way, defeat them. Shake the nations like in a sieve. That the Lord then will bring about a correcting of that which is wrong. No longer will a fool speak and he'll be considered wise. God will set it in order. See, now, that's encouraging to me because things are out of order. And you look at, you know, the, you get frustrated when you see the news, don't you? I mean, it's frustrating to see so-called uh, uh, leaders and, and, and people who so-called wisdom when you know in your heart this is foolishness. And that's, the words that follow are just like this. Verse 5, No longer will be the fool called noble. No longer will the rogue be spoken of as generous. For a, spool, a fool speaks nonsense, and his heart inclines towards wickedness, to practice ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord, to keep the hungry person unsatisfied and to withhold drink from the thirsty. As for the rogue, his weapons are evil. He devises wicked schemes to destroy the afflicted with slander, even though the needy one speaks what is right. But the noble man devises noble plans, and by noble plans he stands. This is the way God's going to set it right. So then he has a call. From verse 9 and afterwards, here's a call to them, kind of a wake-up call. Rise up, you women who are at ease, and hear my voice. Give ear to my word, you complacent daughters. Why, were they, why is he saying this? Because they were saying, peace, safety. Peace is it. We've made an alliance. We're making an alliance with Egypt. Peace. It's all good. It's all good. Safety. We're going to be fine. Peace. We're going to have, you know, it's all going to be good. Now, is there a second fulfillment in the latter days? Yes. The scripture says that the Antichrist will bring about a covenant of peace. And so this Jesus said, Matthew 24 and 25, he said, while they are saying peace and safety, watch out. Because the Antichrist will betray that peace. He will betray that covenant. Three and a half years into that signed covenant, he will betray that covenant. And Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the temple, let the listener beware and run to the hills. Run for safety in those days. So he's now, you see, making a call to them. Rise up, women at ease. Hear my voice. Give ear to my word. You complacent daughters, listen. Within a year and a few days, you will be, you will be troubled 
O complacent daughters, for the vintage is ended. The fruit gathering is not going to come. They're going to, when the Assyrian army comes, they just wipe out all crops. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent daughters. Strip, undress, put sackcloth on your waist. Beat your breast for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. In other words, mourn over them. For the land of my people in which thorns and briars shall come up. Yea, wait, weep for it. For all the joyful houses are for the jubilant city because the palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower become caves forever, a delight for wild donkeys and pasture for flocks until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. Because Israel will be attacked. There's a second fulfillment. Israel will be attacked and it will seem that all is lost. But God will save. God will rescue when the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high and, from the wild, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field and the fertile field is considered as a forest, then, here he, begins, he talks again about setting things right, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will abide in the fertile field and the work of righteousness will be peace and the service of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. I love that phrase because it kind of is a picture of faith. Confidence forever. The service of righteousness is quietness and confidence forever. See, remember the words last week we looked at where he said, this is what you need to do. Be still. Rest. And know that the Lord rescues and saves. Be still. Kind of, doesn't that remind you of when Moses, you know, stood in front of the Red Sea? Stand back and watch the salvation of our God. And he, you know, set down his staff and the sea parted before them and the nation came through. You know, there's that sort of stand back, be still, watch. What does that psalm say? Be still and know that I'm God. The key phrase is not just be still, but know this. That he is our God, that he rescues and saves. So he says, the service of righteousness is quietness and confidence forever. Verse 18, then my people will live in a peaceful habitation and in secure dwellings and in undisturbed resting places. And it will hail when the forest comes down and the city will be utterly laid low. In other words, the Lord will save. How blessed will you be you who sow beside all waters, who let out freely the ox and the donkey in peace, in other words. They get the graze in peace. What a picture. But then it describes for us in chapter 33 the specifics of what the Lord is going to do to break their back. And I was kind of hoping that we were going to get through 33 and 34 and 35. But we didn't. So we'll just stop there a few minutes early and we'll pick it up right there next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace upon us because we know that in a similar way you are calling us to faith. You are calling us to trust. You're calling us to rely on you. And Lord, I pray that we would take those words to heart. Help us to understand that when we rest on you, there is peace, there is joy. There's a faith that fills the heart. And Lord, I love that picture again of you calling Israel as you're calling us to a place of nearness and intimacy. And then then we see that relationship of favor poured out. And you describe all of that favor and what a favor looks like. But then you begin to describe revival. Revival happens when we say to the impure things, be gone, I don't want you in my life. Impurities just rob us. And they, they steal from us. Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you would have life and have it abundantly. 
Lord, so I pray that we would take those words to our hearts and that we would discover again that place of intimacy and nearness with our God. Help us to know what it means to stand on that rock, to rely on you, to have a peace that passes understanding, that guards our hearts and minds. Lord, give us that peace. Give us that rest. Give us that assurance that your hand is on our lives, that your favor is poured out, that we can rely on you. We love you and trust you right now, Lord. We love you and we trust you right now. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, let's give the Lord praise. Glory and honor. Amen.